Welcome back to the second. Uh, oh, this song. Welcome back. I'm uh, Tavi and Yongro. For those of you who are perhaps here for the first time, I imagine most of you are returning. In which case, I hope you had a good lunch. Let me speak up. Sorry. Um, I am uh, very happy to be able to now introduce uh, Professor Tina Kemp, who is the Claire Tao and Ann Whitney Olin Professor of Africana and Women's and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Barnard College in Columbia in New York City. And um, I will also be introducing Luke Willis Thompson, who will be in dialogue with uh, Tina Kemp after her lecture. Um, so what we are going to do in uh, this section of the program very similar to what happened before, is we'll have a lecture, we will have a dialogue with the artist, and then we are going to segue to the um, screening of shorts that are uh, both uh, two, two, uh, two additional artists who are being brought into the conversation through their work, Onyx Anastasis and um, uh, Gio, uh, Gio Wyeth. Uh, we'll see another film of Naima Ramos Chapman and uh, Tiona Nakia McLaughlin, who will uh, then be here uh, to close out after the break, will be our final presentation before the round table. So clear as mud, I know, but one of the films is called Muck Studies, so perhaps it's appropriate uh, that we get into the muck of the programming. Uh, I am really happy. Uh, I said something about what, uh, uh, how, what Tina's work means to me uh, in the morning. I won't, re I won't repeat that. Um, I'll just uh, offer a couple of other uh, um, uh, uh, items from her very, very impressive resume that gives you a sense of the, the, the road that she has traveled to her current uh, lecture on the new black gaze. Uh, uh, Tina Kemp is the author of, in the 2004 book, Other Germans, uh, the 2012 book, Image Matters, Archives and, and, and Photographs, Ar Archives, Photography, and the African Diaspora, and most recently, 2017, uh, 2017's Listening to Images, which has already been uh, um, uh, cited and discussed in our conversations uh, today. Uh, uh, Tina has been in residence as a fellow at the Columbia Institute for Ideas, and the imagination in Paris, which is like uh, a heady combo. And uh, it was through the auspices of that institute last fall that I was very uh, privileged to take part in the first public presentation of uh, the Sojourner Project, which she uh, co-convenes with uh, Saidia Hartman. I won't say more about that except to say that it's just quite meaningful to me to see how these platforms and black feminist study can become enmeshed with each other <laughs> and we can pay it forward, lift as we circulate. And um, uh, let me also introduce uh, uh, Luke Willis Thompson. Uh, his bio, which you have, is, uh, says that he lives in, in London, but he's also uh, um, is born originally in, in, uh, in Auckland, uh, New Zealand. And uh, Luke is someone that I met in New York uh, in 2014 when he showed up in my office uh, and began the process of a durational work of art, which I think in some sense is still occurring to me. Uh, the title of which was, eventually they introduced me to the ones I immediately recognized would take me out anyway. I had to get him to remember that <laughs> over lunch and he did. So um, Luke's work engages uh, some of the most pressing uh, questions facing uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the planet, you know, and that seems, you know, but particularly uh, at the site of uh, the visual nexus and um, how we live and repeat. He gave a phrase to me once in conversation about being ready-mades for violence, right, that kind of encapsulates the quotidian and the exceptional and then also somehow finds a, a space for beauty and resonance uh, in the image that's also um, very important to work such as the Cemetery of Uniforms and, Li and Liveries from 2016 um, and the work that we are going to be able to see today which is pronounced underscore human. Um, 
Luke has been fortunate to win a number of uh, international art prizes, including the Walters Prize in 2014 and the Deutsche Borst Photo Prize in 2018, and was nominated for the 34th Turner Prize in 2018-2019. So uh, it means a lot to me personally that he's able to be with us today and in dialogue uh, with Tina Kempt after her lecture. So uh, again, we will hold questions until the end of the program. I invite you to sit back and attend, dream with us, dream up a different way of uh, doing this kind of work in public. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Tina Camp to this floor. Um, thank you so much, Tavia, for the um, introduction. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to the organizers here. Um, this is a very inspiring group of people, and I'm, I'm kind of humbled to be here. Um, I'm humbled and I'm a little nervous because <laughs> the, the topic of, the, of fabulation was an occasion for me to think out loud about some work that I've been thinking about. And so what I'm presenting today is a kind of unfinished thought that's in progress. And it's part of a larger book project, but um, what I've experienced so far in the day is that that is a welcome um, invitation to think together. So I'm going to consider you all very generous listeners <laughs> and, and invite you to participate in this unfinished thought with me as well. Okay, so it's called Prelude to a Black Gaze, but I don't know if that's still the title of this piece. Um, so just bear with me. Um, I want to start with three paraphrases. Um, and I have a tendency to define terms, and all of my students know that. And so there's going to be a bunch of definitions. So I'm going to start with three definitions of fabulation, or what I'm calling three takes on possibility. Fabulation, a method of writing against the archive. Sorry. Of writing against the archive, telling impossible stories to amplify the impossibility of their telling, speculative histories. Saidiya Hartman, thank you. Ways of telling stories that awaken alternative histories and offer a set of techniques and orientations for fabulating the future, Daniela Rossner. Critical practices of disrupting the constraints of representation, exceeding representation through recourse to black affect, and exploiting the power of falsehood to create new possibilities, Tavia Nyong'o. How do we write, think, story, vision, or imagine black life in excess of representation, against the grain of history, or counter to what seems the inevitable riptide of anti-black violence and premature death? How do we envision black futurity otherwise, in the tense of what I call the future real conditional of that which will have had to happen for black folks to live unbounded lives. At an historical moment when premature black death is an everyday occurrence, what does it mean to refuse this ongoing state of exigency as the perpetually extended present tense of the, black contemporary, of the contemporary black quotidian? And what can fabulation offer us in this particularly perplexing historical conjuncture. While there are any number of examples of black narrative fabulation that might serve as our guide, as a theorist of black visual culture, I'm interested in the ways black artists render black sociality's improbable capacity to defy the deadly gravitational pull of white supremacy. The practice of fabulation that captivates me most recently is a visual instantiation deployed with extraordinary effect by a group, actually a growing group, of bold and talented black contemporary artists. It is a fabulation visualized not through narrative or narration, but through the black body itself and its exquisite capacity to manifest something I can only describe as an anti-gravitational black flow, 
that defies the physics of anti-blackness, which have historically exerted a profound structural force aimed at expunging black life. In this short presentation, I want to explore the visual fabulation of black flow in the work of one of these artists, filmmaker Khalil Joseph. Gravity, a force by which all things with mass or energy, including planets, stars, galaxies, and even light, are brought or gravitate toward one another. Complex gradations of gray guide our gaze through a haunting landscape of shadows and open spaces. Joseph's 2013 short film, Wildcat, scored by electronic music producer Flying Lotus, is a visual study of a rural, a rural Midwestern town rendered as a black and white meditation with a, with a sumptuous, almost tactile texture. Solitary walks, absent expressions, and distant looks render a pensive portrait of black interiority. It captures confident, contemplative blackness set in a dark landscape that to some might signal precisely the opposite. It renders dark rural spaces black folks are trained to avoid. They are spaces of foreboding that bear a history of white sheets and knotted rope, flight, and frequent recapture. Yet these images refuse that trajectory and repaint it in a very different tonality. Grayson, Oklahoma. Cowboy hats crown black and brown heads. They mount and master steers and stallions and parade linearly or laterally in majestic formations. The rodeo is their ritual celebration, a celebration of a community structured by a relationship to land and livestock. It is a community forged as a means of protection. It is a community crea created with the intent to transform a landscape of oppression into a domicile of possibility. Between 1865 and 1915, at least 60 so-called all-black towns were settled in the United States, over 20 of which were located in Oklahoma. Freedmen from the South founded all black towns, the all black towns of Oklahoma, with land provided by members of the so-called five civilized tribes, comprised of the Native American tribes of Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole. At the end of the Civil War, former slaves of the five tribes settled together for mutual protection and economic security. Formerly known as Wildcat, Grayson, Oklahoma, is one of 13 towns that survives to this day. According to the Oklahoma Historical Society, quote, when the US government forced American Indians to accept individual land allotments, most Indian freedmen chose land next to other African Americans. They created cohesive, prosperous farming communities that could support businesses, schools, and churches, eventually forming towns. Many African Americans migrated to Oklahoma, considering it a kind of promised land. When the land run of 1889 opened yet more, quote unquote, free land to non-Indian settlement, African Americans from the Old South rushed to newly created Oklahoma. In those towns, African Americans lived free from the prejudices and brutality found in other racially mixed communities of the Midwest and South. Okay, and now it's gonna get awkward because I'm going to show you the video. <laughs> um, but I have to swap out. Where are you? Stop. Uh, okay. Here we go. Whoop. Hang on.
stop it there because it goes on for six minutes. Oh, you're disappointed. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Um, all right. Black cowboys shuttle massive beasts through fenced... Whoops. Hello. Ah. Okay. Black cowboys shuttle massive beasts through fenced mazes into tight corrals. They mount horses primed to accelerate. They circle and give chase. They ride horizontally and dismount dramatically. They tackle beasts and wrestle them to the ground. They grab and tussle with horns and ropes. They are pulled and pressed downward, yet they rise and they rise. Dusting themselves off gracefully, they return to ride and tackle over, again, over and again. An accelerating black cowboy leans into a tight corner turn, but the turn is too tight. But gravity does not capture its rider. Falling under its weight, the black cowboy never dislodges. They remount together to full stature shrugging off the, both the concern and the approval of another who rushes to extend a hand of compassion and care. Black community, black celebration, they are the pleasures and intimacies of a black quotidian created as an antidote to white supremacy. In the early 20th century, white Oklahomans sought to block African Americans from settling in all black towns like Grayson. White farmers pledged never to rent, lease, or sell land to black residents, while others refused to hire black labor. And the Great Depression devastated many of the, all, of the original all-black towns. While many of these towns eventually failed, Grayson lives on. Wildcat visualizes an impossible narrative of black possibility made real. It is an impossible narrative of black futurity told through a black gaze. It is a future willed into being through the physical and effective labor of first people, freedmen, and former captives. It is the labor of love and community, of pleasure and pain, of, aff of affirmation and refusal. Flow, the gradual permanent deformation of a solid under stress without melting. A brown skinned boy stands tentatively, surrounded by concrete, a massive palm tree rises behind his unruly chestnut hair. Baggy Chino's oversized t-shirt, his, his arm rises slowly, taking aim at the site where his eyes fix in the distance. Hand extended, fingers curled around an imaginary pistol, he pulls the trigger to the sound of a shot that, rec that ricochets thrice and boomerangs back onto and into its source. His white t-shirt and khakis are now bathed in blood. Its excess flows forth like a tributary seeking an unknown outlet. A thick crimson stream curves downward like the languid brushstroke of a master painter collecting in a puddle just below his limp body. Nickerson Gardens, Los Angeles. His mane is more contained, but his cornrows are far from fresh. He is lively and engaged, mimicking gestures of black male swagger miniaturized to his tennis year old frame. Facing off with his lighter skinned companion, their cornrows mirror each other as they wrestle on a brown green lawn surrounded by an inner cityscape of two story mustard colored projects. The camera pans to those possibly observing the scene as a baseball clad black man polishes a late model American sedan gleaming with reflective chrome. It pans, against, it pans again and returns to the boy this time seated next to and listening attentively to a lanky, dark-skinned young man, joined moments later by his round-the-way girl and a gaggle of brown boys who convene convivially, convivially on a bench in a courtyard. The boys coalesce as a band of brothers, running, frolicking, and making mischief, eventually returning our multi-shaded companions to the brown-green field as daylight transitions to a fuchsia-hued dusk. The dreamlike soundscape that guides our, four through Nickers our tour through Nickerson Gardens slowly fades as we accompany his silhouette along a chain-linked fence that surrounds the field. Our gaze shifts abruptly to a trio of limp black bodies that echo our opening encounter. A limp body on the ground, limp body suspended in water, a final limp body on a sidewalk captures the full attention of three small boys frozen in stillness. The sound and sight of air bubbling upward toward, through water toward a distant, undefined surface transitions us both, both sonically and visually back to a black male body 
that is suddenly limp no more. Hypnotic bells segue to the throb of an electronic drum pumping a slow, deep bass line. Metallic, percussive beats shimmer and entangle with the throbbing pumps and a haunting tingle of bells. This sonic entanglement intertwines with the levitation of the blood-stained, limp-no-more black body. His body pulses with the throb of each beat. It twirls with the metallic percussive shimmer. It undulates and rises to the sound of bells and the hiss of cymbals. He ripples alive, resuscitates himself through an improbable self-animation that defies gravity. Untangling himself from a blood-soaked t-shirt and tank shop, he reveals a magically healed bullet, bullet hole in his chest, a mortal wound amplified by blood that still lingers in the corner of his mouth. Ambulating with tiny steps on hyper-pointed toes, he glides up and down, backward and forward, bouncing to the ground, rebounding upward, arcing like an angel, then crouching like an angry cat. He moves neither vertically nor horizontally. His body flows like a viscous material that mediates solid and liquid. His flow continues down a path lined with neighbors and bystanders, possibly family and friends, who, like the three boys frozen in stillness at the outset of our encounter with the limp no more black man, also stand motionlessly suspended. His reanimated corpse flows past their stilled in time bodies, intently making its way to the promise of a new celestial plane. As he grazes them closely, he touches some of them tenderly, frames others intimately. Then, as he approaches the gleaming late, late model sedan that awaits him on the street, it bounces twice, seeming to nod in recognition. Its door lowered by the bounce to just below curb height, he extends a leg at an improbably high angle. Rather than entering, he pours himself into the vehicle transforming his body into a slow-moving liquid that passes into and through the side window. And now awkwardness again, and I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, okay. And I'm not going to, I'm going to show you the whole thing, all right? So don't be mad. <laughs> all right. Do you want the lights down lower? They want the lights down lower. <laughs> Okay, here we go.
black gaze, a framing that positions viewers in relation to the precarity of black sociality, a gaze that requires the effective labor of adjacency. To state the obvious, yes, I am narrating a film, actually two films. I have attempted to narrate, to narrate my own encounter with Joseph's stunning four-minute video, Until the Quiet Comes, a piece awarded the Special Jury Award for short film at the 2012 Sundance Film Festival. But I'm also fabulating an impossible story of possibility. I'm fabulating a tale of black resurrection, a tale of black rebirth. It's a, re it's a recurring story of premature death with a different ending, but it's a story rendered visually, a story rendered through a black gaze. It is a gaze that confronts us with the precarity of black life that uses precarity as a creative form of affirmation. It repurposes vulnerability and makes it regenerative. It shifts the optics of looking at to an effortful and intentional practice of looking with and alongside another. A black gaze does not allow its viewers to be passive to its labor or impassive to its affects. It is a gaze that demands work. It demands the labor of navigating an emotional response to what I describe as the hapticity of black life. And this is different from hapticality. Deriving from the root word haptic, hapticity is a term I use to describe some of the many forms of contact we experience as sensate beings in the world. Physical contact, touching, visual contact, seeing, psychic contact, feeling, as well as sonic encounters with different frequencies and vibrations. But a black gaze adds an important element to our understanding of hapticity. It is a form of labor. It is an effortful practice of exertion and an active form of struggle. It is the struggle to remain in relation to contact or connection with another. But let me be clear, hapticity must not be confused with empathy. It is not putting yourself in the place of another or feeling you understand or share another person's experiences or emotions. It is not about sharing the pain or suffering of differently racialized subjects. It is recognizing the disparity between your position and theirs and working to address it. It demands the effective labor of adjacency. It is the work of feeling done both in spite and because of these differences and choosing to feel across that difference rather than with or for someone in very different circumstances. Far from the satisfaction of identification with someone less fortunate, less secure, or utterly precarious, hapticity describes a commitment to feeling the discomfort of being better off and doing the work of making that discomfort generate a different outcome. It is the labor of adjacency that requires us to feel beyond the security of our own situation. It involves cultivating an ability to confront the precarity of less valued or actively devalued individuals without guarantees and working to sustain a relationship to those imperiled and precarious bodies nonetheless. Hapticity, the labor of feeling across difference and precarity, the effort of, being, of feeling implicated or affected in ways that create restorative intimacy how we feel with and through another in the absence of touch. The impossible story until the quiet comes revisions is the story, is the story of precarious black bodies in a black urban utopian, in a black urban quotidian where premature death is not the exception but the rule. Joseph, an electronic music producer, Flying Lotus's sublimely moving sonovisual portrait of a community plagued by unemployment, poverty, and gangs seems an impossibly fabulated retelling. But what if we refuse the inevitable reading of it as a rendering of melancholy, mourning, and loss in a community riven with violence? What if their retelling, a dreamlike retelling of transcendence in the face of this violence, were in fact the rule? rather than the exception. It would require us to focus on the improbably stilled images on the sidelines of Storyboard P's arresting performance and connect them to the impossible future realized in Grayson, Oklahoma. 
It would require us to fabulate from their stilled but still moving perspective and link the contemporary black urban quotidian with that of a black rural quotidian past and present. It would require us to see them through a black gaze of adjacency that renders them neither passive victims but a community that insists on surviving. Somber faces lined up on a wall, girl clutching boy, stoic boy next to equally stoic boy, mother embracing a child, girl next to boy next to boy next to girl. Their faces range from mournful to implacable, boredom or shock, opaque or impermeable, suppressed rage or disbelief. What is the range of affect or emotion commensurate to premature yet regular black death? Those sepia-washed Californian faces contrast, yet harmonize with those depicted in the somber, t somber tones of a black and white video. A windswept boy and girl on an ATV motor down an expansive rural roadway. They are generational inheritors of a town founded to make them free. Their expressions are calm, peaceful, satisfied. What stories might the young residents and heirs to the legacy of a town founded as a shelter and a beacon of black autonomy share with their kindred in Nickerson Gardens who continue to love and live and persevere in the midst of violence? And what, might their, and what might their California cousins share with the youth of Grayson? What impossible stories of possibility might they fabulate together in conversation? I believe they would tell adjacent and unfinished stories of black resurrection and rebirth forged by communities that sustained them in the long history of black precarity. They would tell stories of loss, yes, but they would also tell stories of survival against all odds and the creation of families, friendships, and alternate forms of affiliation that engender new forms of black futurity. Perhaps it is my own willful form of fabulation, but to me, Joseph's subtle yet stunning visualization of these two very different communities requires us to see Storyboard P's black flow in tandem with the rebounding flow of black cowboys at the Grayson Rodeo. Each is an embodied practice of defying the gravity of violence and premature death, and each is an example of a black community's persistent refusal to capitulate. It is a visual fabulation that requires us to do the work of witnessing across time and space to revalue impossible stories. It is the work of hapticity and adjacency. Thank you.